Hey guys, and welcome to Fika with Rice, a podcast about life hacks, inspirational life stories, routines, and keys to success. I'm your host, Frederick Van Huyen, and each week I meet some of the most incredible people in the world from self made millionaires, best selling authors, experts, and world class athletes. My goal is to extract their wisdom, mindset, tools so you can use them in your daily life, but above all, to inspire you. Let's get this Fika started. Welcome to episode 21 by Fika with Rice. This week we meet Mark Champagne, a mental fitness strategist and author of Personal Socrates, a book about the practices of living legends from history like Marcus Aurelius, Kobe Bryant, Coco Chanel and Robin Williams and many more. Each profile in the book is a gateway into questions to help you think about your life, where you're going, what you want from life and how you can get there. A very tactical and philosophical episode about how you can instill the right mindset to achieve your goals in life, no matter what profession. Let's get this Fika started. This is Mark's story. Let's go. Hello, Mark. Welcome to Fika with Rice. I'm really excited to have you here on the show. So thank you for being here with me. Thank you. I appreciate the time to and the opportunity to jam with you. Sounds great. Uh, Mark, I am... Um, the co-founder of Absolute Internship, which is one of the biggest um, global internship programs for students. So I I thought by starting this conversation by asking you, what was your first internship? Ooh, first internship. I don't know if I, I don't know if I had an internship to be completely honest with you. I went, I mean, I went to business school and was studying marketing, but at that time I had, I had two or three jobs at the same time. I was working in a restaurant uh, a grocery store for, for a bit. And, um, also I was in a smaller town where it was a lot of mining and I worked on in a, in a plant for a while. So I would say, you know, those were two very different internship style, uh, experiences, let's just say from fast paced kind of restaurant world to, uh, let's just say slower unionized kind of feel for a mining uh, plant, for example. So I learned a lot, though, in, in those experiences. Um, Mark, I, uh, when I was 14, I think I was 14, um, my parents, uh, well, I grew up in, um, in a blue collar family. I'm the first one to go to university in Sweden. My parents are from Cambodia, by the way. Okay. Uh, and my parents both worked in a metal factory. So they, they arranged an unpaid internship for me. I think it was for a week or two when I was 14. I had to bike uh, seven kilometers, one way to go early in the morning. Wow. And um, yes, I learned a lot. I think uh, I wanted to ask you, when you worked in the mining plant, what were some of the life lessons that you learned there? Well, I mean, <laughs> I learned that there are, I mean, there are just different, there are so many different types of, of, of roles and positions and, and work that we can do. And in my experience, we're at least specifically in, in the, I was in a plant in a processing plant for, it was a nickel mine. And what I saw or the contrast I saw was having then in the evening going to a restaurant and working in a really fast paced kind of high energy environment. I just, I noticed the contrast. And I noticed, you know, people that were coming in that had either been there for years or decades, and I could see kind of them slowing down and just kind of going through the motions. And I remember like, that's what I was learning or what I was picking up. I'm like, I don't, I can't imagine going through life like that. Like that just wouldn't feel, that wouldn't feel energized or aligned. And then I'd go into this other fast paced environment, right? And things were just moving and you kind of felt... Uh, a little bit scattered throughout the shift, let's say. But I, I remember by the time I got to the end of the summer, because it was more of a summer job at the mine, like I was, I was making really good money there, but I was, I was ready to stop essentially. So for me, it didn't, you know, for me, it, it wasn't the path. And I'm not, I'm not trying to generalize here. I mean, uh, everyone's different, obviously, and uh, that was the experience I had over there. But it was really interesting to see the contrast, and it, it it showed me what I actually didn't want to, to pursue in life, let's just say. It's a valuable lesson. I learned the same. Like, I was like, there's no way, because some of my colleagues, they were 50, you know, well, they looked old. I think they were 50, but I was yeah, yeah. like, well, <laughs> I, I don't want to end up like that, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. 
But when you were young, what did you think you were going to do when you grew up? Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, so growing up in that environment, uh, what ended up happening is I would spend some summers. This was this would have been after your, uh, or actually this would have been before that experience. Obviously, I was younger, but I would I would leave the the city I grew up in and I went to uh, one of the biggest cities in Canada, Toronto. Toronto, Canada. And I spent time there with uh, family that were in business type functions and sales and marketing and, and whatnot. And that was the first exposure that I had to the business world and just like a different pace of life and different experience and whatnot. And that planted the seed or the excitement of, you know what, I want to go to school to learn more about the business world and specifically marketing and, and products and stuff like that. Um, and that's essentially what, I, you know, essentially what I did uh, because there wasn't, you know, there just wasn't that opportunity where, where I grew up. I shouldn't say that. There are obviously smaller opportunities, but just moving to a bigger city in, in, the, in the country provided more uh, exposure to, to that world. So yeah, so that, that, I mean, I never in a million, like I just, I just finished writing a book. I never in a million years anticipated or had had any goals or visions to write books or anything like that. But I did always want to work uh, with people and in some sort of a business setting. You said that you moved to the biggest city of Toronto. Where did you grow up um, and how, like, how big was this town or village, so to speak, Mark? Yeah, I mean, when I, I speak of it as if it's super small. I mean, there's still 100,000 people there. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's a town uh, or, or sorry, I wouldn't say it's a, a village. It's, it's definitely a town or a city, if you will. But it's, it's you know, a hell of a lot smaller than uh, the millions of people that are in Toronto, for example. Uh, and it was about uh, a place called Sudbury, about four hours north of, of Toronto. Um, and I still have family there t today. So, you know, I go back often enough and I'm, I'm actually even closer to that city now. And I, actually now I live in a legit town. I actually live in a smaller place, uh, but it's, it's at the bottom of a ski hill and a lot of, you know, mountain biking and things like that. So uh, here, I think there's 19,000 people. Uh, so it's, it's probably, it's the smallest place I've actually ever lived, but probably the most happy I've ever been as well. <laughs> Why is that Mark? Well, I think I'm just, I'm at a, just a different place, uh, in life at this point. I mean, like I said, out of school, I was, there was an, there was an attraction or excitement to like the big city and business and all this, and this, and all of the opportunity that, that provided, I went down that route. And and tried a whole bunch of different things. Worked in in uh, corporate healthcare in the pharmaceutical world. I was working on these hundred million dollar brands, doing product management and sales and stuff like that. So I I got a taste of what that world's like. But when I left it to create to follow you know an entrepreneurial path and and create uh, an app in the in the wellness space, then now you know working in mental fitness with the book and coaching and, and corporate and whatnot. It's just, I, I don't, I don't, I don't need that, that pace anymore. And, you know, I've, I'm more connected, I'd say to nature and just taking that time and leveraging what, you know, this planet has to offer and, and trying to do everything possible to still my mind and slow down and think, which is what I've learned over the years uh, of interviewing all these incredible humans on the podcast or for that app is that they all take time to prioritize their mind and slow down and ask big questions. And it's easier to ask big questions when you can put yourself in scenarios or environments where things slow down a bit, especially in nature. I love that, Mark. I am, um, you know, I lived abroad as well for the last, I think it's 14 years now. I, I grew up in a very small place, around 10,000 people in Sweden. Okay. And, and the last 12 years, I've lived in um, Shanghai, you know, over 25 mm -hmm. million, London, yeah. Hong Kong. Now I'm in Barcelona, which still is quite big, you know. Yeah, but beautiful place though. <clears throat> it's very beautiful. But, you know, I, I, I've i been reading a little bit what you were saying too, that a lot of important people or business people, they take time to think these big questions. And I do that too. But I agree with you, you need to slow down for it. But I wanted to ask you, do you have a specific process for that? Like, is it Sunday morning at, I don't know, 10am when you're not with your child and your toddler? Or 
What's yeah. your process? How does that look like for you? Well, for me, it, it started about it started about 12 years ago when I was in the corporate space. I, I started getting up a little bit earlier in the morning. And at that time, probably, you know, 10, 15 minutes earlier before starting the day. And I just started reading positive content or learning and uh, learning from authors like Robin Sharma and uh, Tony Robbins and whatnot. And, and just, you know, some of the, some of the usual suspects of Mind Valley uh, and whatnot. I mean, they weren't around at that point, but the people that are in within Mind Valley uh, were. And like I said, it just became very apparent that no matter who I was learning about or, or unpacking their story, they had these reflective practices. And for me, the one that stuck was journaling. So I just, I would take 10 or 15 minutes. I would write down the questions that I was seeing or hearing in, in, in that content. And then I would just take time to write out an answer based on where I was at in my life at that moment. And that process just, that process stuck around for essentially a decade to the point where it, it, it catapulted me into creating a digital, one of the first guided digital journaling apps out there uh, by the name of, of Kyo, which was the Japanese word for today. And that's what really catapulted, I'd say, just my practices. I still do this daily. Every morning, essentially, uh, I spend about an hour doing some sort of mental fitness or physical fitness. And that's the process because the pro you know it's the consistency of doing that every day, that training, just like just like an Olympic athlete would, you know, physically train for for an event, and they mentally train as well, obviously. But we relate to the, the physical aspect probably more. When you, do, when you do your mental fitness training in the early mornings before people are up, or and you can see, if you look out the window and, and, and if you're getting up at 5.30 or 6 or whatever, you can see how many lights are not on. It's part of the rare, you're part of a kind of the rare air of, of people that are doing that. So just that alone feels like, okay, well, I'm doing something that's significant here, different. And, and it, starting your day like that feels really good. So... So yeah, so to answer your question more directly though, there's there's a there's the consistent practice that I have which is just journaling, some meditation, breath work and they, and they they cycle around depending on how I'm feeling or what's going on. But then there's also just pr uh, practices that I'll tap into when needed, you know, if I feel cluttered or if there are a lot of decisions to be made before going to bed, I'll just take out a, a notepad or a notebook and write, what am I hearing? Or what's the best logical next step? Go to sleep and then wake up the next morning, grab a glass of water and answer that question. And it's amazing what you'll, what you'll notice that happens after, you know, eight hours or nine hours that have passed, all of a sudden you have the answers to the questions that, you know, eight hours ago you didn't. So that's one. I mean, there's a ton of them, but that's one that, 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 uh, that I leverage often. Did you get this from one of these? I know Robin Sharma is big, he's huge on, on journaling. And I know he's like really big for the 5, 5 a.m. club and everything. Yeah. Is that something that you, that you got from him or what was the source of that inspiration? Yeah, well, he, so it's funny, ironic. I literally just sent him one of, uh, a copy of my book yesterday to his office as a thank you because... 12 years ago, he was the one that started my practice. And I wouldn't have written that a book, you know, that's called Personal Socrates and loaded full of journaling prompts if it wasn't for that experience. So he started it. But then the, the, the nice thing about any of these mental fitness practices, as long as you're open and, and willing to experiment, you know, it, he'll, he'll reference other people or next thing you know, you know, all of a sudden you see Wim Hof all over the place doing breath work uh, training and exercise. So I've been experimenting with his work. And it just, as long as you're curious and willing to, to, to try these different things, it's endless. And, and the side effect of, of doing these things, or the direct effect, frankly, is that you're more self-aware, you feel more in control, and you're able to think more clearly. So for me, the, the biggest learning, I think, over the last few years, or what I've, I've shifted from, has been, well, now I have a list of different practices that I know that I can that I can tap into. Journaling is the core one for me, but I know that I know that breath work can immediately shift me out of any type of mental state that I may not want to be in. Or I know that meditation will give me some some uh, you know some calming effects and, and bring some more clarity. 
I know that a short walk after lunch will be it will help kind of reset for the afternoon. And the nice thing is like when you take the pressure off of of because I hear this one all the time, like, oh, I have to get my meditation in. When you take that pressure off and just know, hey, I'm dedicating, I don't know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes every morning to do something in this realm. And then you just pick off the list. I call this list the five and ten. What are the five things or activities that you can do within 10 minutes that you know may put a smile on your face when you can default to that list. Then all of a sudden the, the, the mental weight lifts. There's no pressure to just uh, to do a certain exercise, but you're still getting up and you're still prioritizing your mental fitness, which a lot of people aren't. And I really think it's a superpower that a lot of people aren't aware of because we're, we, you know, society is not set up to slow down. Society is set up to be productive. What are, besides journaling, um, meditation, what are other things that people can do? You said the top five things. Yeah, well, so the, the most important question that someone can answer, I think, is this one. is you know, What are the five activities that put a smile on my face or make me feel good? And because for me right now, I mean, like I said, journaling is a staple, but journaling, breath work, reading, um, meditation. And then the other one is, is sometimes, uh, I've been playing around with just various stretching or yoga, things like that. I mean, it changes, right. And we're all different. So someone may not resonate with, with journaling. Uh, that's the one that works the best for me. So that's why I, that's why I say it's, it's one of the most important questions we can ask, because just by answering that question, now you have a personalized mental fitness list, right? That, that can then turn into a practice or a set of rituals that, uh, that you do every day or a few times a week. Uh, another one that's a, a staple that I haven't mentioned yet is just as my coffee's brewing in the morning, um, I read a passage from either the book. I just shifted up the book for the years I was reading out of Ryan Holiday's book, The Daily Stoic, uh, who, yeah, who I'm, I'm grateful to say he has a profile in, in my book as well. So it's all coming full circle. It's just crazy to, to, to think. Um, but I just switched out his book uh, to his, his, actually his mentor, uh, Robert Greene in The Daily Laws. Um, he's got a ton of different books, but same principle, basically one page. It takes a minute to read while the coffee's brewing. You read that. And you just that alone, and we're talking minutes now, right? I mean, maybe a couple minutes, you're starting your day off on your own terms, or you're starting your day off with a mental shift or a perspective shift, right? Yeah, I, lo I love the, the Daily Stoic. I've had it for a few years, and I have it by my nightstand. And I read one page before, before I go to bed for, me, for my wife and myself. Love it. And... Uh, yeah, sometimes I'm so tired. I'm like, what do you think he means here? What does this mean? And my wife <laughs> yeah. explains to me. But I think it's like, I'll try to read it in the morning. You know, I, I love that advice. And I want to check out the book by Robert Greene as well. I've read his other books. And I mean, they are huge, right? They're huge. Yeah. The, the 48 Hour Laws of Power and all of that, right? So. Yeah, I think this one's okay. his most recent. And, and I'm pretty sure it was Ryan Holiday that gave him this advice saying, hey, to, to write uh, one that, is is like a daily flow and it, it's been really good it it, remi it really reminds me of the daily stoic in in many ways but it's just fresh uh or different content i, I should say because my daily stoic i i literally i think it's probably been five or six years uh to the point where that book is is like sun tan from the you know the sun coming from the window and like coffee stains and stuff so it was time uh sorry ryan but it was time to to replace it <laughs> I love when the, but the books get a little bit older, but okay, I, I, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see here. So, Mark, when you know LinkedIn, right? When you look, you when you look up Mark Champagne, um, it says you're a mental fitness strategist. What does that mean? <laughs> That's a good question, man. <laughs> I, I didn't know either. I mean, I, as far as I know, I think I, I, I just made that term up or that, that. Uh, that title up. And here's the reason. I mean, the reason is, is simple from going, I mean, you already asked the questions, been going, going way back in kind of the university or schooling days, I was always interested in business and, and strategy and whatnot. And then when I went into the, the, the workforce or corporate world, 
uh, the roles I enjoyed the most were those, those strategy roles. So product strategist, brand strategist. And as I entered into being more full time on the mental fitness side of things and really helping guide people or teach people or expose uh, people to these, these various practices, I realized there was a combination there because a strategist that, I mean, in its simplest form, you're, you're taking complex scenarios and simplifying them and, and, and putting some sort of strategy or, or plan together. I can't think of a more complicated situation than our lives, essentially, right? There's so much going on. There's so many questions, so many decisions. So for me is, well, how can I bring in mental fitness? Because like we just talked about, it's, it's, it, certain practices will resonate very differently for depending on who you are or, and where you're at in your life. So for me, what I really, really enjoy about the, the idea of being a mental fitness strategist is that I can take a look, whether that's individually or for an organization or group, at what's happening and deploy the right practices that'll resonate and specifically the right prompts. Because the, 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 you know, my work revolves around powerful questions and a powerful question, all that means is that it lands at the right time and it's coming fr you know, in, in, from the right perspective. Because uh, that's when that's when questions really help pause us and get us to think differently. That was actually one of my questions, um, uh, Mark. Because leading up to this interview, I learned that you are really, really good in asking quality questions. And I wanted <laughs> to ask you, where did you and how did you learn that? Well, it started. It started with with Robin Sharma, right? Where when I first picked up the journaling practice, and because of that. Then as I was consuming other content, I started collecting these questions. And then when we launched the, the app, the journaling app, I mean, if you, if for, for listeners, if you think of, uh, many people are familiar with the, the meditation apps like Headspace and Calm and so forth being digitally guided through various meditations. Well, we had a similar concept for journaling, but it was guided by prompts and themes of prompts and working with different brands and, and individuals and so forth. So you know, I, I've been collecting these questions essentially for years. And then also my, my podcast, Behind the Human, I, mean, I think of, I'm up to about 300 interviews or so uh, across that show and others where I'm always grabbing questions from the audience, right? Because my whole thing, again, is that I can interview yoga instructors and meditation coaches all day and every day. Uh, and I've, I've interviewed a lot of them, but I want to know what the developer is thinking or the strategist or the Michelin star chef or the actress or actor or the big wave surfer, like all these different people, like what questions do you think about to help stay clear and, and prime your mind to, to perform at an elite level, right? Like a big wave surfer. I mean, for you to jump on a wave that's 50, 60 feet, I mean, there's got to be some stuff going on mentally to pre prepare yourself for that we can also leverage in other situations. So that, that's, been, that's always been the fascination and, and why, you know, I continue to work with questions and continue to, to collect these questions through the show and, and why the book is all questions and profiles is because that's, you know, I, I really think a question gives us the luxury of a pause, a pause off the autopilot autopilot of life. And when we start pausing and thinking, even in microseconds, that's when opportunities and possibilities starts to present. I read somewhere, because I'm also a big reader like yourself, Mark, and I think I, I read somewhere that you can judge a man by the quality of his questions. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I like that too. I love that. And that's why I was like, I need to get this guy, Mark, on the show, you know, because he's all about questions. So I love it. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do it. Anyway, um, you created this uh, journaling app, Q. Yeah. And why did you want to do that? I mean, obviously you love journaling, but why create an app? Well, there... There was a frustration uh, at that time on my side personally, because I was traveling a lot for the, for the, the role in, in, in the healthcare space, conferences and stuff like that. So for me, my, my journaling practice primarily was digital at that, at that moment. And it was just such a disconnected experience. There just weren't any 
good digital solutions that were we're combining two things. The the one thing that we've been talking about, good quality questions and, and content, and then also with uh, an app or some sort of solution or some sort of word processor to, to, to document and save that. There were a couple apps out there that essentially were, were like glorified notepads that were, you know, that you could save your entries, but there was nothing that provided those prompts and the prompts that, you know, like you're, the consistent prompts that I would reflect on versus, oh, I need to go to this one when I'm trying to do more strategic thinking. Like those were the, those were the, how I was collecting these questions and how I still do that. So, you know, there was just one of those scratch your own itch scenarios where like it doesn't exist. And at the same time, that was right at the moment when the big meditation apps were starting to take off. So there was a bit of a flag or, or, uh, proof of concept there that, okay, well, people are clearly open to being guided digitally, at least on the meditation side. What about the journaling side of things? So that, that's where the, the idea came up with or where it came from. And there was just this internal feeling of potential regret if I didn't try it out. And I asked myself a question at that point. I just said, you know, what's the worst that could happen? you know, I could try it, it could fail, not work. And then I can come back to, you know, the industry that I'm, I'm in, because I, I wasn't in a scenario where I hated going into my job. That wasn't the case. It was, like I said, more of, I'll regret not trying this. Now, I mean, you probably know how the story unfolds, but the, the kind of the worst case scenario did happen. And I had to shut that, that app and that business down. Um, but it, it led me, first of all, I was in probably the darkest place in my life when we did that because we reached 86.9 million people with that app. And so it was, it was successful in many, uh, in many respects. Financially, it, it failed. Um, and at that point, it was, there was a realization that, wow, this, this truly is the work. Like, I want to be working with questions and mental fitness. Like, this is the stuff that really lights me up. So I was left in a really tough spot because. Now my backup plan, right, which was if, if the worst case scenario happened, which did happen of going back, like that didn't feel right anymore. So now what do I do? And I just deleted the, the business and the app that was keeping me in the space, lighting me up. So it was, it was really challenging and going back to one of your questions a, a while back ago, like why I like questions so much. There was one question that literally saved me from going down a deep depression. And that was, what do I want for my life? And when I, when I paused enough, what, you know, that question paused all of the other, all, all of the other negative looping thoughts, like what would my family think? How could we fail at such a colossal level? What would our investors say? Like all of the, the questions and thoughts that were driving me down into the, into a, a further hole, that question paused and gave back hope. And then, cause then the next one came, okay, well, if, if this is what I want, then uh, who do I need to speak to? Like, what's the next step? And, and, and just led to more and more questions, which is essentially just the, the Socratic method playing out that has been around since the beginning of time um, and set me down this path of, of or, or this path, and I should say realization, because this, just given how severe that, that scenario was for me personally, the realization finally was, no matter who we are, where we're at, what's going on in life, we're all one question away from a completely different life or completely different outcome. That question, that question, you know, saved me from, 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 from going down to a dark place and, and brought me to where the only reason we're speaking right now. And same goes for anyone in the moment when you're, if you're feeling stressed or anxious or depressed, I mean, you're one gratitude type question away from a completely different mood or mindset. That's a very powerful statement. I love that. What are some of the biggest misconceptions about mental fitness, you think? It's a really good question. I think, I think the, the, probably the biggest one that I see or, or feel is that you have to dedicate a lot of time to doing it or, you know, cause it's, it's not like we walk around with open slots of space in our calendar and our, our days for the most part. So it's, it's seen as, uh, here's another thing to do. Like I'm already struggling to try to get in my exercise or my workout or whatever. Um, how am I going to get in 
a meditation or whatever that is, or when am I going to journal and so forth. And I would encourage people to, to shift the perspective. Cause I mean, you, you're doing it. I'm do you and I are both doing mental fitness or in the practice in a very similar way, but in different p- time periods in the day. I mean, you right before bed with your wife reading that passage. I mean, that doesn't take very long, but that the, 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 combination or the compound effect of doing that every night, you know, has huge results, huge, right? And I know in the morning that it has, you know, it it literally sets up my day or releases anything that I I may have dragged, might be dragging into the day. It sets up my day to, to succeed or at least start the day off like that. So, you know, my point is that just start small, you know, and, and look at, Look at your current routine or the rituals that you already have and see where you can stack on one of these mental fitness practices or take a look at your calendar and see, okay, I just identified those five things that I know make me smile every day. Well, am I doing any of those things throughout the week? And if the answer is no, just slot it in 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 a way that it's 10 minutes. You know, we all have 10 minutes. And then what happens is that you start seeing the results, obviously, and you start seeing what else you can do. And you start realizing that, okay, the more I create space for this kind of work, the more productive and the more results actually will start to show up in the right results, right? Because now any of these practices, they, 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 they unlock more awareness, more self-awareness and more clarity. And that's always the starting point. It doesn't matter w- whether it's business, whether it's personal life. I mean, if, if you're not clear on who you are and who you want to be or what your business is and what you want your business to be, what the product is and what you want it to be, then it's, it's nearly impossible to fill the middle with the right steps, right? The right actions. So that's, you know, that's, that's the benefit of these practices. And if you find the ones that work for you and that, 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 that light you up and bring that clarity, then th- your whole world expands, right? It's just, um, it's one of those, those feedback loops that, I mean, I'll, I'll sign up for all day long. It's just, it's, it's endless. I love journaling myself, Mark. I've been journaling for many years. And I remember at least back in Sweden when we were young, um, in Swedish class, we were encouraged to, to write the diary. So we're oh, doing it awesome. when we're like 10 or 11. I don't know if it's common in Canada. No, I mean, not, at least not when I was uh, that age. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's, that's amazing. I mean, I do hear uh, one of the other misconceptions, actually, when it comes to journaling. Because uh, in North America, I feel like there's this perspective uh, of, of, of what journaling is, is that it has to be, it's, it's the diary about the girl writing about the boy at school and, and jotting down her feelings type thing. Like that, that, those were the comments I used to get all the time when I was talking about the app. And I would love to just bust that myth and just, especially for adults as well, just think of journaling as just reflection. And then now, now it doesn't matter whether it's pen to paper, it doesn't matter whether it's an app or an audio note or just a walk when, you, you know, in silence where you, where you answer a question in your head. Like it's the reflection is the practice, right? So if we can find those, those, those vehicles or those methods to just to, to deploy the reflection, that's where the magic lives. It's true. I, I was positively surprised. A few months ago, I read the book uh, Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. Oh, so and good, right? It was amazing. I finished it in two days. I couldn't put yeah. it down, you know, and I oh, loved it. was it. the same. And, uh, and what I loved, like, He's so masculine, right? You see him like muscles, like this is like the man of the man, right? And, yeah. And this guy been journaling like for so long. <laughs> so true. Yeah, I had the same, the same, uh, the same observation and feeling with that one. Uh, and man, what what a what a book! Such he's just a master storyteller. It is true. But you said you wrote a book. It's called Personal yeah. Socrates. Why did you write the book? Well, it was, it came out of that realization when, you know, when I was deleting that business in that app, right, that, that were one question away from a different outcome. And 
it was in my own journaling, going through those, those tough moments to find clarity that the realization was made, well, just because this app didn't work out from a financial perspective doesn't mean that the practice of reflection and doing that through questions and bringing in the stories and the narratives of others, like what you just shared with, with, with Matthew, like that opens other people up to the practice. And we saw, we saw that happen with the, with the app. I mean, 86.9 million people were interested in the app, right? I mean, we screwed up the product flow that, that, that's not on the people coming in. Um, I shouldn't say that. I mean, we should be, be kinder to ourselves. We were figuring it out. We needed more time and money, like the story goes. So the, the book, though, is, is a continuation of that experience. It's, it's, it's a book that is inspired by probably a lot of the similar people that light you and I up, just judging by this conversation. But it's inspired by quick daily reads. There are profiles uh, on people like Picasso or Maya Angelou or Kobe Bryant. Uh, James Clear. So there are people from present day and also people that have passed or the legends of the past that basically what I'm doing is I'm profiling their work and their thought process through the angle of mental fitness and figuring out, okay, for Jane Austen, for example, I mean, one of the most famous authors out there uh, that's, that's been gone for a hundred years now, I mean, the, the profile on her is all around looking at her lives like a novel or like a story. You know, who are the characters of the story that you've, that you've currently built or currently written? Now we all have the opportunity to write the next chapter. So I just, I provide the prompts to guide people down that path. And they're short. They're two to four page profiles with the idea. I mean, it's, it was written specifically with the idea of what you and I have been talking about of me doing the, the morning practice while the coffee's brewing, while you're doing that in the evening, it takes 10 minutes to read these profiles. So if that's, if that's the time that you have, then the, the profile can be your mental fitness and it combines that knowledge plus reflection, which to me is, is the formula to then you know, deliver insight, right? Or clarity or possibility. So. So yeah, that's what it is. Personal Socrates questions that will upgrade your life from legends and, and top performers. Yeah, I, I was. Well, I'm still a big fan of Kobe Bryant. What? Yeah. What were some of the key lessons that you learned from him through your well, research? Well, that he, yeah, that he, that he was human like the rest of us. I mean, his profile is uh, his, his opening prompt is, "How do I get to the rim?" which has nothing to do with basketball, actually. And has everything to do with, he has an objective to be the best at something, and so can we. And we, just, we, we, we need to identify that something. But Kobe was human like the rest of us because when his alarm would go off at four o'clock in the morning to get in the extra workout on top of the team, he had the same negotiation going on in his bed. You know, oh, it's, it's warm in here. I'm just gonna stay here. I'll get in the workout later or I'll do it uh, you know, tomorrow or whatever, like we can out negotiate ourselves in microseconds, right? I, I, I did it when writing the book because I was writing the book in the early morning. And I remember the one time I just, I went through this whole series of thoughts and like question answer kind of period within seconds thinking, okay, yeah, uh, I think I know my afternoon is kind of open. I'll, I'll write at 2 p.m. I, you know, I need sleep. Sleep's important. All these different things, right? Uh, and what happens? Life happens. You, you wake up, you do your thing. And next thing you know, is 2 p.m. Uh, comes and goes and there's no writing. So the, the learning from Kobe was he also went through that. But what he did was he ensured that he was very clear on the objective and or, or goal, I should say. And his goal that year was to win an NBA championship. And he knew, OK, to do that, if I put in the extra work and the extra workout, I'm going to be better. I can lead my team better. That's why I need to get up. And then I layered on one other practice within his profile from Mel Robbins, which is the 54321 uh, principle or protocol. Basically, count back from five. And once you hit uh, one, get out of the bed. I mean, she used that for crippling anxiety to, to break that cycle for her. But you can use it for anything, right? You can use that principle to send an email that you, you know, you've been uh, 
uh, procrastinating on or to pick up that book and read those four pages. You know, whatever it is, do your meditation, just five, four, three, two, one, cut the narrative and, and go for it. So, so yeah, so I mean, it, it, that's, it's a perfect example of, of how a lot of these profiles are built. They're just all the practices that I've been picking up over the last 12 years, plus the prompts that have been coming along the journey, all coming together in curated, quick mental fitness profiles, let's say. How did Kobe have those reminders and his, his objective? Did he have like written messages on notes or written messages on his wall when he woke up? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he, if he had those reminders. I do. There is someone else in the book, an Olympic athlete, Apollo Ono, that had that uh, ritual. He had post-it notes as reminders in the areas uh, of his house that he would frequent most and just served as quick little uh, affirmations or intentions for the day, plus, uh, you know, reminders of, of goals. Just again, because the, we're all human and there's, there's, there's distraction everywhere, right? I mean, any of the social media apps, the technology, I mean, they're designed to distract us and pull us into their ecosystem. So we need, if we don't do something and just stay on that autopilot, we'll, 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 never, we'll never beat those algorithms, right? So, you know, Apollo Ono was the, was the guy that I'm referring to. The, I think he's the most decorated winter Olympian in U.S. history, at least. Uh, and that was his Olympic-level reminder system, essentially post-its. Kobe, though, I know he asked some pretty big questions. I mean, uh, there's a, I share a story in, in his profile when, I think it was the Boston Celtics, they, they had lost the, the NBA championship uh, to them. And he was in his hotel room and he was feeling terrible, obviously. You know, he felt like the, they should have won, that they let the team down, all the, all the regular things you would think you would be thinking. And he went to bed like that, but when he woke up in the, ne the next morning, he changed his, his narrative, and he did that through a different set of questions. Um, I'll have to paraphrase, because I, I don't have the book in front of me, but, but there are essentially questions for him to get clear. Okay, well, what can, you know, what can I do differently? How are we going to come back and and make a difference in in the next season, for example? And it was those questions that paused his looping narrative as well, right? And said, "Okay, I've sulked. I've it, it. You know what happened happened. Now it's time to move forward and to move forward to achieve that goal. These are the things. These are the rituals that I know for me personally work. And again, you can tap into that goal or that uh, that objective." when you're faced with those moments when it feels more comfortable to stay in bed. I, I saw that Coco Chanel is also in the book. Yes. It's Good amazing. Coco Chanel. What are some of the key lessons you learned from her? So Coco Chanel was fun because, well, first of all, she was one of the hardest profiles to write. Um, I started and stopped that one a few times. And I think it was just because you know, I, I didn't know Coco Chanel very well. I mean, I, I know of her and her brand probably like most, and it was just very surface level. So when I started doing the research and, and getting into, and, and, you know, she was, I obviously didn't interview her, that, so that was, made it even more challenging. So when I got into the research and started to unpack, okay, what, what's the unique thing about Coco Chanel that we can really leverage? And it started to become clearer and clearer as I let, again, time sit a little bit, right? And just give some space, work on some other things and then and come back to it when it felt right. And eventually what surfaced was, uh, her opening prompt is, um, how can I become irreplaceable? And because from the research, it was, it was very obvious that when Coco Chanel entered a room, her presence was felt. And that made me think of, well, when any of us enter a room, there is a presence. And when we leave a room, whether we think about it or not, we do leave some sort of presence behind. And often we don't think about what that presence is or to be intentional with, hey, if I'm going to enter in this, this room or this situation, meeting, call, whatever, how am I going to show up? Or how do I want to show up? And how do I want others to feel after I leave? And there was this interesting kind of parallel play happening because obviously she's also known, known for you know, her perfume, Chanel number no. five, 
which leaves a, you know, a physical smell from a room as well. So there was kind of, it was fun working with that. There's, there, there was a, an actual energy left behind, but also a physical, you know, sense or smell uh, left behind. So yeah, so hers is really all about that, all about reminding, or again, for us to slow down and think about that presence that we want to leave behind and, and, and how we want to show up for others because it, it makes a difference. I think it does. I think it does. Um, about that, I am, um, again, doing some ho- homework before this conversation. Mark, yeah. And um, you mentioned somewhere that curiosity is a key trait among people in order to be present in any conversations, you know, or any group settings. Yeah. Um, because you can feel it, right? And yeah, yeah. I'm, I've always been a very curious person since I was a child. And I wanted to ask you because I'm an outgoing person, but can one be curious, but shy? What are uh, your thoughts yeah, on that? That's another great question. So the line, the line is, and this is coming from the second profile in the book, Chip Conley, that the, the most curious person in the room is also the most present. And we feel that presence, as you mentioned, right? You, we all know when you're in a conversation with someone and they're looking over your shoulder or you, you're at a conference or something and, and they're looking for the next conversation, like they're not present in your actual conversation or, or with you. People feel that. Or in today's world of, of a ton of different Zoom calls and whatnot, I mean, people think that they're tricking you and not being present, but you, you pick up, you know, when someone is, you know, essentially just logged in, but not actually participating and not in, in, in presence of the conversation. Um, so you know, to train those curiosity muscles, if, if you are more of an introvert and it's not, you know, you're not as naturally curious, I, I'd say, first of all, we all, we all are born curious. So it's possible to come back to that point. I mean, it's there. We, we wouldn't know how to walk if we weren't curious. You have to be curious to try and first grab onto the table and inch your way through or to crawl. And then th- that's all curiosity, right? And especially with kids when it comes to questions. I mean, I have a five-year-old right now. I mean, we get nailed with hundreds of questions a day. And, uh, you know, I know that as, as he goes through the school system, unfortunately, the hand will start going down, down more and more, right? They'll, the kids just ask less questions because they're fear of being judged and so forth um, until there's a point in life where something big happens and then you start asking questions again, right? So for me, my goal is always how can we shorten that gap or how can we, we lessen the gap in the sense of, of remaining curious? Because like you said, I've, I've noticed through all of these interviews and everyone in the book, they, they held on to their curiosity. So for people that are trying to train those muscles, this is where any of these mental fitness practices will come into play, especially journaling. Because if you're asking yourself questions about how you may feel that day or how you want to show up for people or what are you pretending not to know or where are you playing safe in life or in your work, as you're asking yourself the questions, you're training yourself to see questions in other places. You start to see the detail, right? And to Chip Conley's point, when you're present, you're also present because you're, see- you're, you're trying to understand, right? So if you focus on being present and really there, you'll naturally ask more questions. So it's available for all of us. It really is. And I think, you know, the, the moment we, we stop asking questions is the moment where we flip into an autopilot and things start to feel not great. So I'd encourage everyone to just, you know, take their time, be open, be curious, and, and just ask the things that you want to know. That's, that was Larry King's profile, actually. And he was a legend at, uh, at interviewing people because he would ask the questions that everyone wanted to know. It is true. I, I read Larry King's book a few years ago, and I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. Wild. Anyway, Mark, I, um, you're a big reader. I'm a big reader. And I wanted to ask you, which is the book that you go back to over and over again? Like, which is your favorite book? Which is the book that you've gifted the most, your family and your friends? 
Oh, great question. I, when it comes to, oops, I just pulled out my audio. I'm sorry about that. Uh, sorry about that. When it comes to books, I, I'm always of the believer that the best books are the books that resonate with us right now in the moment, like the ones that we need to hear or learn from. And if you ask the question, you know, okay, well, what do I really need to learn or what, where can I use help and go to a book on that topic? Those are the most valuable, valuable books. So it's hard. It's often hard for me to recommend books because we're all going through different things. The author though, that I go back to all the time, we already talked about him, Robin Sharma, uh, is one that I know and it, it, and is on my list, my top five list of, I know if I pick up any of his books, that it's going to spark a shift in perspective or it's going to spark a new idea or help me process whatever's going on. So I'm actually, I'm reading his latest book right now, the, uh, what's it called? It's on my desk, the hero, the everyday hero manifesto, um, which I know he always says each, each one of his books is the greatest books he's ever written, uh, or his best book yet. And I, I'm always saying, of, of course you're saying that, but this one I have to say is it's, uh, it, you know, and I've read all of his other books. This one really summarizes and br- I'm, I'm learning new things about him and, pra- and new practices. So I, have, I highly recommend to this one. Thank you. You're so right. He always says right? that, you know, I've this read my all best the, book. All, yeah, I've, I've read, I don't know if I've read all of them. I've read three or four, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, yes. When I've seen him on Instagram, like this is my greatest work so far. You have to read it. And, but anyway, I'm gonna give it a, I'm going to give it a go. I'll take your recommendation. Yeah, it's Thank very you, good. Mark. <laughs> Mark, um, where can people find you to learn more about you and where can they go to say hello to you on social media? Yeah, I mean, the easiest place, one link is, uh, is just behindthehuman.com. And uh, my show, the book, the social handles, they're all over there. Uh, if you search behind the human, on on Instagram, uh, that'll pop up as well and available on LinkedIn. But behindthehuman.com is probably the easiest place or the hub for for people. And yeah, shoot me a message. I mean, I'm accessible. I'd love to know which questions, whether they're from my book or others, just like which questions are really helping you uh, either now or during big life-changing events. Uh, as you probably have gathered, I'm, a, uh, I'm pretty obsessed with collecting these prompts, so I'd love to reshare them for people. Amazing. It's been awesome to have you on the show, Mark. I really appreciate your valuable time. And I'm sure our audience have, um, have learned a lot from your act- very actionable advices today. So thank yeah, you. Thank you. I, and thank you for showing up with awesome energy. I mean, it makes these experiences, uh, it makes them great and gives me you know, energy to continue to do my work. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mark. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to Fika with Rice. I hope you enjoyed the show. Who do you want to have on our show? Let us know by sending me an email at frederick at absoluteinternship.com. And before you go, if you like this conversation, don't forget to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube or Spotify to get to listen to more inspirational stories and life hacks. We really appreciate it. See you next time and much gratitude for listening.